among other things, is a choir director. So uh, since you've all volunteered to be in the choir now, he'll <laughs> let you know when the rehearsals are. I just want to share also, <clears throat> Padma this morning was talking about Swami challenging all of us. Well, in 2009, 2010, Swami went to uh, move to Los Angeles. And he asked a number of us to go with him. He wanted to start a center there, which now Narayan and Dharma Devi are running. And he asked Bhagavati and Ramesha, who have been singing, and several others to form a singing group. And he said, I want you to get the music out. And you know, Los Angeles is not a humble, simple, pure city the way Swami's music is. So they were having trouble finding places to sing, and Swami said, he said, go anywhere, go anywhere. So they were going to karaoke bars, singing Swami's music. <laughs> and then they told me, they, he, and then finally they said, Swami, we have nowhere to go. And he said, just go sing in the park, sing under a tree. So they went out in the park and they just sang under a tree, but Swami's music got out in Los Angeles. So thank you for your sacrifice. So now, we have some wonderful, I shouldn't say sacrifice, thank you for the fun you had yes. in bringing Swami's music to Los Angeles. So we have a number of questions that were submitted online, but we also want you to have a chance to ask questions from our live family here. And uh, not that the family online isn't live, but uh, <laughs> alive, but anyway, it's nice to have personal attraction too. So let's just see, we'll give you the first chance. Anybody here want to ask the first question? If not, we'll go. If not, we'll prime the pump. Yeah, we'll prime the pump and we'll kind of go back and forth between uh, questions submitted online and your questions. Yeah, please stand and ask your question. You can take your mask down so we can hear you better. I, I was wondering, I was touring Swamiji's apartment the other day, and I noticed several books on extraterrestrial topic now in the, in the media, and I was just wondering if he ever related any personal experience of UFO encounters to you two. Okay. Uh, to repeat that, tell me your name again. John. John. <clears throat> He's part of our online community from Oklahoma. So um, he said when he was in Swamiji's apartment, he saw several books on extraterrestrials and UFOs, and he wondered if Swami ever had any experiences like that. Swami had a long time interest in UFOs. Um, in fact, when he was with Master, uh, one of his fellow disciples asked Master about UFOs. And Master said, oh yes, they're true. He said, life is everywhere, including inside the sun. And so this thought of we're the only ones and could there be other, now whether there um, were UFOs visiting, Swami never related any personal experience, but we have had people, my own brother related an experience, who's about as far as you can get from woo-woo. Uh, and, and he had an experience where a UFO, a disc-shaped thing, came over him, lights blinking over him while he was driving, uh, went about a quarter of a mile ahead of him, and then just stopped and hovered there. And he stopped his car, watched it for about a minute, and then it just took off. Um, uh, we've had long-term members up at the meditation retreat, Satya, 
for those of you who might know him. He saw a UFO outside of the area where Swami's dome is up there. And it, it too, um, stayed stationary for quite a long time and very close and very clear. So uh, people have seen them. Uh, Master certainly uh, said that, that life is everywhere. So make of it what you will, but um, they're out there. <laughs> Okay, so maybe any other questions from the floor? And yeah. say where you're from as well, because it's it, most impressive. Yeah, and I'm here for the pilgrimage and the spiritual renewal week. So. And where are you from? Uh, I live currently in Glastonbury, Somerset, in UK. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, and, and originally from Moldova. Uh. <laughs> Um, I've got a question about the second coming of Christ. I know there is a book. I haven't read the book yet, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, to ask if you wouldn't mind elaborating on what has been passed on about, about the second coming Christ and uh, just okay. to share if you have any personal insights on this as well. Master spoke about it, and he said the second coming of Christ actually is his, he called his mission to the world, the second coming of Christ, because it's the Christ consciousness that he came to awaken, not the person, but through the techniques of meditation and Kriya Yoga, we all awaken the Christ consciousness within us. And so he said the second coming of Christ is when all of uh, his disciples awaken the Christ consciousness within them. but. I've often wondered, and this is pure speculation on my part, Master never said this, very careful not to say it, but you know, he spoke of when uh, the Christ child was born, baby Jesus in the cradle, the three wise men were Babaji, Lahiri, and Sri Yukteswar. And then that kind of begs the question, well, where were you, Master? And where was he indeed? And so the second coming of Christ may have two meanings. It may be that perhaps he was that incarnation, although he never ever said that. But it just, it, it's kind of interesting to connect those dots. And so it may have the awakening of people seeking God into Christ consciousness, and it may be the reincarnation. One time Swami asked Master, were you Jesus Christ? in that life, the master said, what difference would it make? Very interesting answer. Um, if you're interested, first of all, there are several books by master and by Swami. There's also a course online that uh, Brahmachari Sagar, who spoke yesterday, um, he teaches and it's uh, very, very well received. So if you're- of course on. A course on Christ and the mystical teachings. The Bible is filled with mystical teachings that reinforce everything that uh, that we that our path teaches. Master taught that all true religions uh, meet in in uh, the pathway to self-realization. Hi, I'm Vandana from uh, Delhi, India. So I have a question about death. So did Swami say anything about um, how to uplift when you have a loss of a closed one? Yes. Not about master though, yeah. Okay, I just want to do a little introduction of Vandana who just asked the question. She is a very highly, re you can sit down there, very highly respected physical therapist and chiropractor and she has several clinics in uh, Delhi area, Gargon, Delhi. She goes all over the world lecturing, and she's very kind. She treated Jyotish and me when we were in India, and a few years ago, Naya Swami Shivani from Assisi was in India, in Rishikesh, and she fell and broke her ankle and was in a wheelchair, and Vandana went up to Rishikesh and helped her for three weeks, just every day. So she's a very beloved friend, and if you see her. 
give her, I, give yeah, her energy. I can attest personally that there was a time about three years ago when I was having real shoulder pain and almost a frozen shoulder. I thought I was going to need to get an a operation. But Vandana treated me, and there's absolutely no, no pain at all anymore. So um, anyway, OK, question. so the question on, on how to work with grief. Um, you know, there's a process of that is right and that can, there's so many things in life that it's, some of it is right, too much of it is wrong. Ice cream, donuts, coffee, grief, you know. Um, we, we do have to have a period where we, our hearts are hurt when a dear friend or a loved one or a family member passes. And there needs to be a time where we are honest in the feelings that we have. We're going to talk, there's a question here, an important one about stuffing emotions. So we can't stuff our emotions. We, we do need to recognize when our hearts are hurt. In the autobiography, Master describes how after the passing of his mother, he spent a couple of years, of course he was younger, he was 12 at the time, but where daily he would go out under the tree and weep for his lost mother. Um, then it was fulfilled for him in a vision of the Divine Mother. And that had a spiritual purpose. So also for us does the loss of loved ones. It awakens in us a longing, a deep love. And sometimes it awakens in us, if we're devotees, a exploration and a deeper understanding and of acceptance of what happens after death, of the soul going to the astral plane. But it is not good to stuff the feelings of loss or, or you know, feeling that you've lost something that is very dear to you. On the other hand, there comes a point where if you keep dwelling in that emotion, that it then begins to pull your energy down. At first, it lifts you up. Many things are this way in life, that at first they lift you up, and then if you cling to them, the energy, it's as if like a ball thrown in the air. At first it rises, then it reaches its peak, and then it begins to come down. And many emotions are like that, that, that they rise at first, but then they begin to draw you down if you cling to them. And so with grief, go through the natural process, but don't artificially continue it any longer than needed and try to, as much as possible, with all emotions, bring them up to the spiritual eye, from the heart to the spiritual eye, and offer them up. And also, Master gives a number of techniques for communing with lost loved ones so that it isn't like a severance, it's a continuity. And he said, and I really like this thought, I've been having lost two dear friends in the past six months. He said, every time you send your lost loved one love, it's like a river of joy flows to them. And so that's a very nice, it, it's living. There isn't a severance, that's the important thing. So if we approach grief and loss in the right way, understanding that the, the, the continuity between soul friendship and loved ones is never severed. It actually can become a vehicle for spiritual growth rather than, oh, I lost this and I lost that. Because sometimes, <laughs> you know, there's a marvelous book called Having Our Say, and it's written by two black American women, sisters, 
who were in their hundreds when they wrote it. And their parents were born into slavery, educated themselves, started one of the first black colleges in the South. They were educated, but they had so many experiences. But at the end of their life, almost everyone they knew had passed away. You know, even, they never married, but nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters and everyone, and, and someone asked them, uh, what do you think about the future? And, and one of them said, well, we don't buy green bananas anymore. <laughs> but, you know, we'll all get to that point where they're all gone. But we have to realize that it's like the, the continuity between this world and the next. And um, we've been there, we've been the little ones, we've been the old ones, and it just goes on and on. Someone, my brother you recently sent me a picture of me that I hadn't ever seen when I was about seven years old. And I looked at that picture and I thought, cycles and cycles. There I was, a little girl starting off in life. Now I'm 70 years older than that. And yet it, it's just all, it, it's really quite lovely and it's quite expansive. So you don't have to think of it as loss and a door that's closed forever. I know many, many people have told me experiences they've had with loved ones who have passed away, telling them of their life in the astral world, telling them to how much they're enjoying themselves and how much they're freed from the suffering they had in the body towards the end of their life. So really, the the wise person looks at death and loss and grief with the understanding that it's all part of the cycle of soul evolution and love and soul connection never, ever is severed. For all of us, you know, on the astral plane, people are drawn together according to the vibration that they have. So. If we're all in harmony with the vibration that's here, Swami is up there with the ones who pre are preparing the way. We're just going to go and be in another community with them as long as we want to. If we want other experiences, then we'll have that. But if that's the natural vibration, we'll all be together up there. And I'm convinced that we've been, most of us, together many, many times already. That's why there is a sense of immediate friendship and um, kind of comfort uh, in each other. Okay, we can't, we've got a bunch of questions, so we can't dwell too long on any of them. But we'll come back to uh, questions from the audience. Several mature devotees recently remarked that they were, are disappointed where, with where they are spiritually. Some have expressed shame about it. They expected at this stage in their life that they feel more spiritually free or advanced, less reactive, more peaceful, content, and free. All know the importance of sadhana and seva. Some share their sadhana is strong, others not so much. Some actively serve, while others less capable offer prayers, etc. Some are isolated or isolating. What encouragement and advice could you offer? Well, this is a complex question and a very real issue. You know, there is a seed of discontent in our hearts that simply will not go away until we're united with God. And so there is a divine sense of disappointment, one might say. Shouldn't be really disappointment. It should be a sense that you're still striving to achieve something. Now, how you're striving is very, very much less important. Whether you're meditating a lot or not so much, serving outwardly or not so much, that's less important than the desire in the heart to reach God and also to serve. So the balance of those two. 
There's a beautiful affirmation by Swami. In fact, I'm going to write a blog. I don't know whether it's my next one or not, but on the power of affirmations. But there's a beautiful affirmation that says, I go forth in perfect faith in the power of omnipresent good to bring me what I need at the time I need it. Now, most of us think of that in material senses. Well, I'll get, I'll get the money that I need or I'll get the help that I need. But he will bring you, God, omnipresent good, will bring you the spiritual experiences that you need at the time that you need them. In, uh, in the meantime, our job is just to keep doing our job as best we can. And so the encouragement is keep, keep at it. When you're assailed by disappointment, try not to let it bring you down, but rather to motivate you to say, okay, let me keep trying. And God, he knows what I need when I need it, and he will bring me those spiritual experiences when I'm supposed to have them. We struggle with, to a certain extent, unrealistic expectations. You know, we think that, gee, I started on the spiritual path when I was whatever, 22 for me. Uh, many of us were about that age, 22, 23. And here it is, I'm not gonna say how many years later. <laughs> and I'm still not enlightened. Well, my friends, we have lived many, many, many lifetimes. So in one lifetime, it's better to think of it as one day in third grade and the next day in third grade, not the last, you know, we only have one lifetime and now we're going to be free. It's incremental process, but we're on a great, great path with a great, great master. And I honestly don't think there is a better path, certainly not for those who are drawn to these teachings. Kriya Yoga cleans out the spine. Meditation uplifts the consciousness, as we've been talking all week. And just keeping at it, Gradually, we are going to be free, but if we have unrealistic expectations about how fast that should happen, or whether it should happen simply because you've meditated for however many years it is, it's a, we have millions and millions of lifetimes of misbehaving to overcome those samskars in the spine. So let's just keep at it and have faith in God. Also, it's very, very difficult to be able to assess our own spiritual progress. Um, one time we were riding in the car with Swami and I was in the back seat and he was talking about different people who their growth and progress. And it just sort of came uninvited from my ex I express. I said, gee, I, I don't see that I've changed so much. And he turned around. He wasn't driving, but he turned around. And he said, how can you say that? You're an entirely different person than when you came. Well, I sure couldn't see that. I just saw the same old, same old problems coming up again and again. But you know, even at the end of, I mean, this is so touching. Towards the end of Swamiji's life, there he was, uh, you know, 60 years of discipleship, starting a great work for Master all over the world, and 150 books, and 450 songs, and 6,000 public talks, and probably many were unrecorded that we don't have. But he said at the end of his life, I don't know that I've really pleased Master. And we just thought, oh, Swami, how can you even think that? But it's very, very hard to evaluate, to assess 
our own spiritual development. In a way, it's better not even to think about it. That's why Master said you plant the seed of your own spiritual aspiration, and then you water it and protect it. But if you keep digging it up to see, oh, is it growing, is it growing, you kill it. So just plant that seed. We've all planted that seed. Water it with our devotion and our commitment. Nurture it and protect it with your love for God and Guru and your attunement, and let them take care of the rest, God and Guru. You know, Master promised, he said, to my disciples who stick with the path till the end, not just for sticking it out, but with true, sincere commitment, he said, I promise that I, or one of the line of gurus, will come and spiritually usher you into the higher plane, personally usher you into the higher plane. So that's a pretty big promise. Don't get discouraged. We don't know what karma we're working out in this lifetime, but we have a great guru who is guiding each one of us, each one of us, to our final fulfillment in God. So don't ever get discouraged. When we get discouraged, honestly, that's Satan. Swamiji said, anything that p makes you think less of yourself is a satanic influence. So when those thoughts come, just say, get thee behind me. I don't know, maybe the technology is out there, but what would be really nice is to have a little picture frame in our meditation room that has a little electronic button. And every time you get discouraged, you hit that, and Swami's lecture on laughter comes up. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. As we uplift ourselves, a strong drive to uplift the world through specific and maybe yet not, not yet thought of ways fills my body and soul with energy that needs to go somewhere to fulfill our dharma for serving Master's mission. What can you say about sharing, dispersing our good karma, and fulfilling our dharma of being part of this move movement now that an even greater fire is lit within us? Well, just to answer briefly, um, we all need to be on fire to share these teachings, but it can be done in many ways. It can be done in humble, obscure ways. It can be done in big public ways. God doesn't care. But as practical advice to this person, I have seen when people try to go off and start a big work for a master, it's very, on their own, it's very, very hard. Swamiji was like the uh, prow of a boat, of a great ship, and he cut through the waters, the turbulent seas, and he enabled us to continue that work. And we're very aware, none of us could have done it on our own. And to be truthful, Swami couldn't have done it on his own. We were talking about past lives, and we often laugh that when Swami was coming down to earth, he said, I'm going down, who's coming with me? And we said, we'll come, we'll come. And uh, we started this work. But if you feel this desire, compelling desire to help spread Master's work. Try to merge it with the Ananda flow rather than trying to branch out off on, on your own. And the beauty of Ananda is it's so open. So many ideas are possible. If someone comes and says to our Los Angeles leaders, I'm Narayan and Dharma Devi who are sitting right there, I really feel I want to do this. I've seen our leaders again and again said, well, let's see how it, we can help make that happen. But if you just say, I'm gonna go and do this on my own, it, you won't have the kind of wind in your sails to really pull it off. Yeah, I would just add a footnote to that. You know, if there's something in your immediate environment that's calling to you for help, 
maybe there's a little venue where you can teach meditation or do something. By all means, do that. But uh, what Davy's talking about is it's very, very hard to expand out beyond your natural circle. It takes a lot of magnetism and a lot of energy, and most individuals do not have that. Ananda does have that, and so by serving in, in harmony and in cooperation with others, if you want to be part of a bigger work, then, then that's possible. We have hundreds of ways of serving. If you're interested, get in touch with uh, Jatindra and Sagar, who are working with the um, online and the virtual community. And there are many, many ways of, of serving. Um, so maybe take a question from the audience? Yep. I am Liliana from Argentina. And oh, it sounds so... It's uh, not that loud. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to ask you what you think or how do you can help uh, somebody that killed himself, I mean suicidio, suicide? Yes. Suicide. What do you think about that? How can we help somebody oh, that is gone already? Uh, tell me something about it. Okay. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> this is a tragic situation in the world. There are many suicides, and the tendency is growing. Um, and it's, it's hard to know what to do. The obvious thing to do is if there is any sense that you know of someone who is headed in that direction, do everything that you can to uplift their consciousness. Many times what's happening, and Nirmala today talked about it, is people are spending too much time on the internet and connecting with downward pulling energies. And I know it's not possible, but the best thing that we could do for someone who is um, in that condition where they're, they're doom scrolling all the time is get them away from electronic um, devices and get them out. If there's any potential to get a person serving then the energy, the positive energy flows. So what we're really struggling against is a downward pull and a collapsing energy inward. And as long as that keeps going, then people will lose hope and they'll lose the desire to live. And so whatever we can do to reverse that flow and if it's possible to help somebody serve others um, and get out of the thinking about themselves, that's, that's the best. There are also problems with drugs and alcohol that exacerbate that. Anything we can do to get people away from that, it's good. Um, if you can help get that person in a positive environment, then that can be helpful. But the, the key is to get a positive flow of energy going in order to counterbalance the negative collapsing energy. Also reach out to professional help if you can, because there are often uh, things that can be done uh, medically or technically um, that, that those of us who are just wanting to help uh, aren't able to uh, do on our own. But if someone you know or love has already committed suicide, how can you deal with that? Well, you know, a lot of the traditional Christian religions call suicide a terrible sin. That's not how the yogis see it. Um, it's not good karma to take your life. It's bad karma, but it's not, you know, you are forever doomed and damned to hell. In fact, this is a slightly strange story, but some of us remember 
in the early years of Ananda, there was a woman who came to stay here, and she had struggled with s extreme depression since childhood, and um, just attempts at suicide. And she came here for help, and we, we did what we could, and we tried to help her. We had people with her pretty much constantly, and just trying to uh, change her diet, get her to do more positive things. And then after some time, she left, and we kind of lost touch with her. And then we heard, after a few years, that she had taken her life. And Swami's response was actually quite lovely. He said, you know, I think that's the best she could do in this lifetime. She was born with a chemical imbalance and that she couldn't overcome. She tried. Let her start over with a new body and a new life. And it was loving and forgiving and compassionate. So if we know of someone who has committed suicide, send them your love. Send them hope. Say, next time it will be better. And, um, you know, the Master says that when people commit suicide, they're often, when they're their next birth, they won't live very long. They'll be maybe a stillborn child or die in early infancy because they've denied life. And so they have to affirm life to have a long life. But it's, it's just an act like any other act. It isn't the soul is forever damned and condemned. Also, we have uh, a member of the community, Gopal, who has extensive training in suicide prevention, and he's thinking of doing uh, an online course in that. So it, it would be good to do and, and very helpful. So Nectar had a question. Yeah, my name is Nectar and I'm from LA. And since we're talking about death, I couldn't help but think about during COVID, um, myself and so many of us lost loved ones at a time where we couldn't be with them to comfort them. Um, there's part of me that feels guilty to this day. It's been almost, uh, not quite two years. So how can I overcome that guilt feeling that I wasn't there um, at, at the time my mother left her body? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you have to first accept that you didn't have a choice. It was not something you were ignoring your mother. You just weren't allowed to be there. And secondly, when the soul is close to the end, and in fact, there's a question in the, from the online group, if you're in a coma or heavily medicated at the end of your life, are you still conscious? Well, the soul is conscious, and your mother knew. Try to remember that. Your mother knew she, you were sending her your love, that you wanted to be there. She knew that, of course she did. And there's no need for guilt. You know, my mother died a number of years ago, not of COVID, but of another disease. We'd been with her, um, you know, pretty much round the clock. But that night, we went back and slept. And she passed away that night, and we weren't there. And I just thought, oh, if I'd only stayed that night, did it matter to her? I don't think so. She knew we loved her. Your mother knows you loved her. So just really transmute that feeling of guilt into sending your mother joy and love and say, I look forward to seeing you again, mother, in a realm of light. So. Um, in my last blog, I wrote about a woman who had a near-death experience. And one of the things that happened is as soon as her consciousness or her soul left the body, now she was going to return to that, but her soul left the body, 
out of the body, she could immediately feel the prayers of people that were just acquaintances who were praying for her. And she could feel how much love and help, and she realized she needed to connect more with people who were a little bit more peripheral. But if the soul can feel the prayers of someone who's barely connected, think of how that soul feels the prayers of a daughter. So your mother's soul knew that you were with her and you were with her. Your bodies were uh, separated by regulation that you couldn't do anything about. But one of the big lessons that we have to learn in life is to not think of ourselves as the body and the personality. We're really the soul and the soul of your mother, the soul of you, have a connection, had a connection, but that connection is still there. So try to let go of the feeling that you weren't with her because you were. You were with her in consciousness. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Aditya, Brahmacharya Aditya, who I don't see here, but I'll share this story. He told us a beautiful story He's the head of our work in Pune, India, and a dear friend. And he said, there are two doctors in Pune, they're a husband and wife, and they both, when the pandemic hit India, and it hit hard, uh, our dear friend Nayaswami Dhyana said something, sometimes they were doing 15 or 20 astral ascension ceremonies a day. So they were dealing with a lot of loss. But Dr. Amar and his wife, Dr. Mansi, they were each serving in different hospitals in COVID wards from the beginning and saw many, many deaths. And then when Mansi was getting kind of just very pulled down by all of this and uh, both disciples of Master. And then she had a dream, a super conscious dream where she was in the hospital ward, and Master came, and he was dressed in silver robes, so like he was in the astral, they were in the astral world. And she said, Master, why is this happening? And he said, well, the earth, people on earth have some bad karma that they're having, having to work on now, work out now. And, but we must keep very busy to help them. And he was running from room to room and doing this and fixing that. And then the dream shifted and she and her husband were sitting outside and they were making little dolls, little figures out of mud. And then when she held one, it became like a little living child and she was shocked. And she kind of stepped back, and when she stopped touching it, it became just mud again. But then she held it again, and it became like a living being, a little child. And she again asked Master, what's going on? And he said, can't you see, when you see God's hands with everyone, they're filled with life. When you make that, when you disconnect that bond, then they become just, they go back to the earth. So if we see our lost loved ones, either grieving, suicide, ruining that we couldn't be there, just know that if, if we can send God's loving presence to them, that living connection, it continues. So. Um, she, he, he also said that um, what she was experiencing was the sense of what Divine Mother is. When Divine Mother touches something, right. it becomes living. If she's withdrawn or pushed away, it's dead. So that's why our prayers are very important because they draw the presence of Divine Mother uh, in, into the world. One more from the audience, is that, or do you wanna? I think Okay. this is a short one. If this world was free from struggle and strife, would we need to incarnate on a different plane to learn our lessons? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Fact Master said that 
we actually do incarnate on different planets. And this has always seemed a little bit mean to me, but he said, otherwise we would catch on too quickly. <laughs> and so, at, at least at this point, I don't think that this world is close to being free from struggle and strife, so I don't think we're going to have to worry about that. I want to <clears throat> do this question, and I was just laughing at something, inwardly at something Narayan said this morning during class, quoting a beautiful soul, Sam Pad Padani, uh, who is a deep disciple of Master, reading Swami's book, saying, um, of letters saying, gosh, I would just say, figure it out yourself. We could do that too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> figure it out yourself. Okay, but. So this question is, recently I recalled an extremely difficult and traumatic experience from the past. Intellectually, I can understand some aspects of it, of what happened, but the difficulty lingers. I feel I should forgive this person and have tried to offer it up many times in my Kriya practice, and yet the memory of this experience still causes me pain. Any additional insights or suggestions for transcending this experience and finding freedom? This is something we all struggle with, just whether it's forgiving someone or just recalling a traumatic experience and how to let it go. And Master gives some pretty strong advice. This is uh, quoted from a talk he gave. Memory was given to man to reproduce good. To abuse the power of memory is harmful. To think hatefully of another person because of some remembered injury he inflicted on you is a misuse of memory. One should not bring back any wrong thought and relive it, for then it will stay longer in the mind. Memory was given to us to keep alive only life's good experiences and lessons. Get rid of wrong thoughts by avoiding recalling them. If they come to mind in spite of you, refuse to entertain them. Let me repeat, to remember bad experiences and dwell upon them in is, is an abuse of God's gift to us of memory. Pretty strong. So when those thoughts come, just let them, don't entertain them. Just say, okay, there you are again. But I also recently read a technique that uh, is extremely effective that if you have any memory of pain or suffering, don't, so Master says don't entertain it, but another way to do it is to go inside of it. Instead of just feeling the emotional reaction, when your mind is very calm in meditation, go into that pain and suffering and sit in the middle of it and realize it has no hold over you. It's just, it's just like bursting a bubble. And this is extremely effective. Master says if you do this repeatedly, you will find great freedom. So when, if you have negative associations with anything, feel, get comfort, do it when you're centered in your spine in meditation. Hold the mind there and then go inside that experience and sit in it and feel your freedom. Nothing on earth can touch me. Rise, O oh my soul, in freedom. It's one of Swami's songs. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. <clears throat> one is that, so, probably going to sound a little bit like tough love, but dwelling on past hurts only strengthens your ego. And if that's what you want to do, then dwell on them. Um, if you want to lessen your ego, then you need to recreate new pathways in the brain because Master talked about grooves in the brain and how if you keep running the needle through those grooves, they grow deeper and de deeper. Today, with more modern terminology, he would talk about brain circuits 
the more you run the energy through a particular brain circuit, the richer and faster the neuron connections happen. And so by allowing your mind to run through that nerve channel, that nerve circuit, that, oh, I was so hurt, oh, he wronged me, oh, you just keep, keep reinforcing it and reinforcing it. Instead, as soon as that energy starts that way, figure out the opposite of that. Maybe it's a happy experience, maybe it's a uh, forgiveness, maybe whatever works for you, create a new pathway and start actually working on strengthening that new pathway. The brain, the brain is very plastic and it will do what we ask it to do. And if we ask it to dwell on uh, anger and frustration, it, happy to comply. But it's not going to make you happy and it's not going to cure the situation. There's another one in here which will answer about uh, stuffing emotions. And it's, it we'll, we'll answer it in more detail. I just want to touch on it now. It is not denying uh, um, an emotion to transcend the energy that you're sending to it. Recognize, in this case, if you're feeling anger or, or somehow that you were wronged, recognize that you feel that way and then try to transcend that energy. If you say, oh no, I, a spiritual person never feels that way and I don't, therefore I don't. Well, that, that doesn't help, but there's a middle ground. Just practicing the same old negative patterns is not going to get you out of them, and it'll just make you unhappy. Hi, I'm Prashad from the village here. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you're still doing your daily reading of uh, Whispers from Eternity after meditation, and how is that going, or how did it go overall? Um, the answer is yes, mostly. So there are days where um, it, either I forget or it isn't, you know, I'm kind of rushed and I, I don't, but I certainly have made that a practice and it is absolutely wonderful. Those whispers from eternity, Nirmala talked about uh, not getting love letters. Well, there's a whole book full of love letters there. And so if you want one, just uh, read one. I do find that I'm slowing down in the sense when, so what Prashad is referring to is in earlier classes, Jyotish and I said that we, um, after meditation individually, we each have a copy of Whispers from Eternity next to us and uh, we'll go through the book and read one. And at first I would just sort of be marching along reading a different one every day, but now I find I've, like I'll get to one and I'll think, oh, I don't even get half of the blessing of that. And so I'll read it over and over and over again. So I'm making less progress through the book, but I think I'm uh, going deeper into the meaning. The one I really got stuck on was number 103, which Master said you should read it over and over till your mind is filled with those thoughts. And I, I see why. So. Anyway, yes, thank you for asking. Good evening all, my name is Bhangeshi. I have, been, I have come from Pune. Uh, I just uh, had one question. In the morning, uh, Nayaswami Padmaji very beautifully explained ego transcendence. I was just thinking how we can catch ourselves before we go into that egoic track. Like, Many things are happening and we don't understand. We are actually on an egoic, under taking that reaction or taking that situation egoically. So how we can catch ourselves before we pass through that and then learn that it is, I am on a egoic side or it is not a right side. Okay. There's no simple answer because there are a hundred ways to approach it 
But the essence of it is the essence of this week. If we can keep our mind and our hearts uplifted, then we will either not, the mind won't go to those things, or if they go, we'll trance it out of them very quickly. So it really depends on um, techniques, attitude, devotion, love, service, all of those things. But the whole essence of it is to keep our mind and our hearts uplifted. And if we do that, we dwell in the house of the Lord, and the Lord will help purify our thoughts. Another very helpful technique, uh, Sri Teshwar first demonstrated it with Master after he had given him an autobiography of a yogi in the chapter on experience in cosmic consciousness. After Master had had that profound experience of oneness with all creation that he'd been longing for all his life, Sri Teshwar said, now let's go out and sweep the balcony. We must keep our feet firmly planted in the ground, therefore there is much work to do. And they did. And Ma uh, Swamiji said, Master did the same thing with the disciples of Mount Washington. When he would, and at a certain point in Master's life, he would meditate with the renunciates there. And then after the meditation, he would say, now let's go out and sweep the walkways. And so the point of that is, we need to build a bridge between the feeling of soul identity that we have in meditation and the more ego-limited identity we have when we go about our daily life. So it's a good practice. Uh, Jatisha and I do this. When you finish meditation, do something that doesn't require much thought, that's rather simple, but serviceful, and then try to keep the same consciousness in your mind as you're performing that action, sweeping or folding laundry or making a bed or whatever it might be uh, that you had in meditation. And the more you build that bridge, the more you practice that, that bridge becomes like a great, uh, what do they call that, a suspension bridge that just goes over the gulf of delusion and you realize that you've been living in a state of soul awareness all day long. So we start by building little bridges. Okay, I'm going to read a question here um, because it's an important one. I have a friend who says during his time at Ananda, he, quote, stuffed and ignored any negative feeling out of fear that he would be judged by a culture that prioritizes meaning, maintaining positivity exclusively. He goes on to say, quote, affirmations are great and powerful tools, but I also need to fully acknowledge my difficult feelings and work through the shame I experienced by having them. It has been so freeing to begin to accept myself as fully human, end quote. I wonder if you have suggestions how to respond to this line of thinking after today's uplifting class. It seems like all we need to do is smile, laugh, serve, and love God. But my question is, how do we know if we are serving our guru or serving our ego? So, complex and delicate question. First of all, um, we do need to accept and recognize that we have negative feelings, to deny them um, now, whether this person who was being quoted uh, wouldn't recognize that he had them, that would be even worse than knowing that he had them but not wanting to show it publicly. Um, if the fear is that you're going to seem out of tune or weak if you show um, difficult or negative feelings, um, find a friend or two who won't get too uh, bent out of shape by you sharing your difficulties with them. But uh, so, so that 
you don't stuff them, you don't feel that um, these can't be brought into the light of day. We need to accept uh, where we are and the feelings that we have as a starting point. The problem comes if we make that our end point. Because if we keep kind of stuck at the same place, so what is all this stuff about affirmations and positivity? Is it just kind of a la-la denial of the humanity that we all have? No, we're complex beings with a spectrum of feelings. And so it's one thing to not acknowledge that we have a spectrum and that we have lower feelings or downward pulling feelings or um, emotions, whatever they are. But it's the other, th another problem is thinking that, well, two problems. One is that that's all we are. And secondly, to keep practicing the lower aspect. So we have a lower aspect and a higher aspect. The whole Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata is about that battle. So we have many tools to try to stay in our own positive self. That's very different from, oh, I'm just putting on a funny face, and but my real self is something else. Your real self is not your negativity or your shame or whatever it is. Yes, that's a part of you that Master talked about. Uh, our thoughts like being mental citizens. So we have those mental citizens in ourselves, but you don't need to give them a soapbox to take power over your consciousness, recognize that you have them, and then do what you can but do it sincerely. It's, it, it is a very little avail to do something because you think that it's socially acceptable or socially not acceptable to do the opposite. And that doesn't really work very well. We need to sincerely get behind the desire to uplift our consciousness and to keep it uplifted. And then if you're sincerely dis behind that, then all the things that we've been talking about become tools to help continue that. But you can't do it falsely, and you can't do it only because um, of some sort of being politically or in this sense, spiritually politically correct. Um, we, we, have to, we have to be real, but understand that our reality extends not just to the depths of our consciousness, but also to the heights, and we'll be happier and freer in our own thinking if we emphasize the upward direction. Yeah, I don't, it's well answered, Jatish. I don't have much. So maybe we'll take one more question from the audience if there is one, and then we'll say yes. Go ahead. Hello. I'm Andrea. I live primarily in the Ananda Assisi community. Um, I just wanted to say, Jyotish, especially, that I've, it's delightful, and I've really been inspired by watching your creative process carry through these years. And I especially love the picture that you put in the uh, folder for the guests this time. It's beautiful. But I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about your, when you paint, when you go to paint, do you um, just go to, to it when you feel like it? Or is it something that you have to sort of encourage yourself and do it and then the flow comes after? Well, um, if I could go to it when I feel like it, I probably wouldn't be here tonight. Our, our lives are actually quite constrained by, and so I get very little time to paint. Um, and I've just come to accept that. Um, but I enjoy it a great deal. And I, I guess 
for me, it kind of builds up the desire to do something nonverbal and creative. And then when that gets too overwhelming, then I give in to it and push aside any other duties. Um, but it's a balance, you know. We all have a certain certain subset of things that uh, give us energy and enjoyment, and we do need to um, to be creative and to do some things that are in our life just because they give us enjoyment. If we are constantly just serving, and especially if we're serving with a kind of a sense of, I don't know, negativity toward it or, or a little bit of resentment that we are called on, that doesn't do us much good. So it's better to take a break and do something creative. But um, it's, it's also something that Swami very much encouraged in me. He said, you're too mental and painting will help you uh, work with your intuitive side more. Okay, I think uh, maybe we'll call it a night. And thank you so much for your wonderful questions. And it's been lovely sharing with our family online and here in the temple. And uh, we will see you tomorrow for a wonderful class with uh, three of our wonderful teachers on uh, the Guru-Disciple relationship. Oh, good night.